guest. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you guys so much for having me, Imam Ghazali Institute, Abu Ayyub. Um, uh, obviously, as as he mentioned, we'll be talking about Shah Waliullah today. Um, I don't. I, I didn't realize how much you guys did speak about Mughal India, so I did prepare some slides. Uh, but before that, I really wanted to emphasize the fact of how uh, important Shah Waliullah sort of becomes um, in South Asia. So I brought this quote um, by Allama Iqbal. He has a quote in Persian and a quote in English. You know, the great uh, Indian Pakistani poet Muhammad Iqbal, where he says, um, he says, this is in his Piyami Mashif, that come, O Iqbal, and come and drink a goblet of wine from your own selfhood, from your own self. And this is will become important as we talk about his notion of selfhood. For you have left the wine house of the West as a stranger unto your own self. Right? And this idea of being sort of foreign to your selfhood, as opposed to sort of not being foreign, as opposed to being home, um, really drives much of Shalula's work in, in terms of epistemology, ontology, metaphysics, theology, um, the, uh, the, 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 the sort of notions of, 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 uh, of preservation of hadith, um, as we'll all get into, um, inshallah. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and start. This is a really cool picture actually of Babur that I just <laughs> wanted to share of the first Mughal king. Um, but I think also as we sort of approach history, um, we need to make sure that we're not engaging what is known as hagiography or just sort of, you know, talking about the high details of the saints. Um, and the great Moroccan philosopher Taha Abdul Rahman has this very sort of interesting book called uh, Tajdid al Manahij, or sort of uh, Tajdid, the revival of, of, uh, of exploring our past, because of the fact for the past 200 years, um, you know, either Muslims have written in a, an incredibly Orientalist paradigm where they have, a, where they have used tools, foreign non-Islamic tools, non-Islamic approaches um, that are not native to us approaching sort of our, um, our, our religion, right? And the equivalent of this is that imagine if we were to use the tools of usul al-hadith or the theory of the hadith to study Western history, right? They would never accept it. So why do we accept the reverse? Sort of what Taha is asking. And that Muslims, you know, as my undergraduate professor Wal Halak used to say in our seminar, that Muslims for the past 20 years have actually not written history which is you know, perhaps a very aggressive statement. So whenever I do any lecture, I always try to make sure that I'm you know, sort of providing a manhaj, a methodology, as I wrote here. That where do we sort of start or approach um, our past, right? Uh, Taha Abdul Rahman has this very, very interesting sort of take uh, in, his, in his book, Su'al al-Akhlaq, where he speaks that our Torah, that we are in our past, we are, we are in our sort of um, heritage and our civilization, like, like we are in the world. There, there is no escape from it. In the same way that we live in the world, there is no escape from, from leaving our past, right? And so we have to sort of approach this in this lens that we are intimately connected. Um, Taha Abdul Rahman actually gives this really phenomenal example that our past is like a mother. Our past is like a mother that gives birth to us. And in the, in the same way that it's necessary or compulsory upon us to honor and venerate our mother, so too it's compulsory upon us to venerate our or sort of respect our past because our path has given birth to us just like our mother has, right? And this is really, really crucial. Anyways, these are just some sort of preliminary points um, you know, and, and then he mentions the hadith, the, the hadith mentioned in Bukhari, narrated by Anas al Malik, that the maternal womb is hanging by the throne of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc., etc. Anyways, um, I think you guys have uh, Abu Asad Abu right? Like, you guys, can you just remind me how many of the Mughal kings did you guys do, slash, which period did you guys go up till so I can know where to sort of start, slash, stop? Yeah, we, we, um, assalamu alaikum. Uh, we tried to cover as much, you know, in terms of the Mughal history. We started with Babur, the foundations of the Mughals as a continuation of the, of the Timurids. And we went all the way up until, uh, the essentially the fall of the Mughals and the beginnings of the British Raj. So, so we did cover them, but not always in, in full detail, you know, especially after Aurangzeb then we started to just sparsely cover a number of the uh, the Mughal Padshahs. 
Okay, so did you like it, like in terms of your covering or like you, you you did a pretty much survey of Oring Zabe's life, right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, perfect. So that's that's sort of where we'll start. So I mean, this is just a cool statistic that I found from two Cambridge statisticians who did a economic survey um, of the Mughal GDP. Obviously, GDP is a modern term, and this is an economic projection onto the past. But this is you know based on their sort of study that the Mughal Empire was about 24% of the world's GDP for comparison today is about, America is about 15%, China is about 12, 13%, India is about nine, 10%. Um, so there's obviously, you know, um, a reason why the British do come to India. Um, uh, I, I brought this passage from Jahangir's memoirs, but I don't think we need to do this. This is a, a interesting from Babur's uh, a Farman that he wrote to um, sort of confirm a Qadi, a Mughal Hanafi Qadi in 1527, 1528 AD. Uh, this is preserved in the British Library in London. Um, this is a transcription of that that I did with my professor. Um, this is anyway, some, some other points. This is the legal system of the Mughals. Uh, this is this is important just just for a refresher. By the time of Aurangzeb, operations commenced for the full takeover of India. Because remember, in 1660, when Aurangzeb sort of has this sort of uh, reckoning with his generals, where either he can do one of three things, right? The first is that he can complete the conquest of southern India, of which he does. The second is he can go invade Iran, and the third is he can go from what is Mughal Burma and try to go into China, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Anyways, he decides to. Uh, sort of uh, uh, press on into southern India because no Muslim king, rather no king in the history of India had ever completed the entire conquest um, of the subcontinent. So he spends about 40, 50 years in the Dakkan campaigning, you know, Hyderabad, Bijapur, Pune, Madras, Bangalore, Karnataka, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is important because Shaulula is born in the year 1702, 1703. Aurangzeb is still in the Dakkan. So Shaulula is actually born in the twilight of Aurangzeb's life. So Shaulula uh, is about four or five years old when Aurangzeb passes away. Now, as you might remember from Usad Abu Ayyub Zakshir, Aurangzeb actually moves the capital from Delhi to Burhanpur, Aurangabad to sort of um, really press on into the Dakkan and, and, and sort of complete the conquest of the Dakkan from the Marathas. Um, and so Shaulullah never really sees Aurangzeb, but although he is about four or five years old, uh, his father, Shah Abdul Rahim, whom we'll speak about, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, Shaulullah is born into a very scholarly family. Uh, his father is an alim, his grandfather is an alim, a very Sufi family as well. Um, it seems that his father was, was, uh, had ijazah or this permission uh, as a Sufi Sheikh in the Naqshbandis in the Chishtis. Um, I'm not sure about the other two, but definitely those who shall will complete all of the four when he goes to Medina Murawara. Um, and uh, his father sort of begins education with him. Uh, what's also very interesting uh, is that Shalula's father, Shah Abdul Rahim Dehlawi, was actually on the committee for the compilation of Fatawa Alamgiri. Fatawa Alamgiri was a legal code. Uh, to my knowledge and to my study of the Hanafi past, uh, is the first time that any Muslim government had ever uh, uh, sort of created a systematic legal code. So the Ottomans only do it in the 19th century with the Majalla, and it seems very likely they sort of just not plagiarized, but they just followed what Aurangzeb did the Majalla uh, from, from the Fatawa Alamgiri. And uh, he created a legal system code because of the fact that now wherever Aurangzeb conquered, you know, the empire, you know, was from here. We have a... Uh, we have a picture here of Aurangzeb's empire. You can see modern day Kandahar all the way to present day Burma, um, to Madras in the south. And in every single town, Aurangzeb has appointed a Hanafi Qadi, right? And some, some larger towns obviously have Hanafi Muftis, but because in every single town there's a Hanafi Qadi, Aurangzeb now sort of sees the need to create a sort of standard legal system, which sort of culminates in the Fatawa al It's not necessarily a Fatawa book in as much as it's a sort of a political and, and a legal document, it comes in about five volumes. We do it a lot when we become um, a muftis uh, in Madrasa. It's, it's one of the main books that we read and, and, and study. Um, but his father is actually on the committee. So, so Aurangzeb had appointed one major figure, uh, Mullah Nizamuddin Sahalwi, uh, whom, by the way, if, um, if anybody is interested, is also the founder of the Dars Nizami, of which Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all of their sort of alum courses are based on this sort of code of study. But the same scholar, Mullah Nizamuddin Sahalwi, is actually appointed as the head or the Sarparas uh, to compile legal opinions of the Hanafi Madhab. And he has about 15 ulama under him, uh, of which um, Shaulullah's father is one of them. Shaulullah mentions this, uh, the anecdote of his father and Aurangzeb. They didn't necessarily get along. 
uh, but that's a story for um, another day. Um, I wanted to uh, sort of just mention some political stuff because um, a lot of people, when they, uh, when, sorry, this is, uh, when they when they discuss Shaolula, they they really miss out on um, the the political social history. Uh, usually, when I do this presentation, I do a little bit more on Orangze, but I want to spend more time on Shaolula. So these are just some letters uh, that were printed in the 1910s uh, from Orangze. Um, anyways, uh, so. Aurangzeb dies in 1707, and in 1707, Aurangzeb's sons goes to war, as is the Cengiz in the Taimuri system, that all of the sons battle for the throne, you know, the famous Mughal statement of Takhtia Tabut, or uh, the throne or the coffin, you know, either, either you're going to die or, you know, you, uh, or you become king, right? That was Takhtia Tabut. Uh, Aurangzeb's four sons go to war, namely Bahadur Shah, um, Azim Shan, Gambakhsh, and, uh, and, and, and one of the grandsons. And uh, basically Bahadur Shah becomes king, styles himself Shah Alam, and he rules for five years. And in my estimation, Shah Alam was actually a better king than Aurangzeb. But it, the issue was, is that Aurangzeb, you know, was when his late eighties, early nineties, when he passed away. So there was, uh, his sons were in their seventies. And because of that, uh, they, you know, and these were the people that Aurangzeb had spent most of his time on, sort of training and nurturing and uplifting and honoring. And, uh, and Bahadur Shah was, in fact, an incredible, incredible king, politically, socially, intellectually. In fact, um, the, the, the major usul al-fiqh work that we study in Madrasa, you know, when I was in South Africa, it's called Nurul Anwar, written by an author named Mullah Jiwan. Um, his main tutor was actually Mullah Jiwan of Bahadur Shah. So obviously it must have been, a, you know, must have been trained in usul al-fiqh, tafsir, Arabic, Persian, you know, mantiq, logic, etc. Um, and, but unfortunately he passes away in only five years. And now uh, the grandsons come to power. So here's a really interesting painting that was painted in the late 18th, early 19th century. So you see Taymur, you see Babur, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, um, Shah Alam, you can see here on the right. Uh, in green, and then you have his son uh, Jahandar Shah, and then you know his great -grand his grandson Muhammad Shah, Farooq Siyar, uh, Shah Alam Alamgir II, etc., etc. So there are many, many civil wars that goes on. But basically, between the from from the year that Shah, from the year that Shawila is five years old, 1707 to 1729, when Shawila leaves Medina and Mecca to, to Hajj. Um, he sees the death of about five to six Mughal kings, which is absolutely wild because before that, as you guys have learned, every other than Babur, every Mughal king's era was, you know, between 20 to 50 years, right? The most being Akbar um, and the least probably being Babur, who was about four, four, only ruled for four to five years, um, you know. And uh, so uh, this is obviously a huge uh, a sort of political crisis that has enveloped the capital of, of South Asia, you know, Delhi being the Baghdad of India, the Damascus of India, but really a lot more grand than Abbas al Baghdad, you know, way more grand than Umayyad Damascus or Mamluk Cairo, um, just in terms of scholarship and buildings and in the spreading of knowledge, uh, especially of Sunni Islam. And uh, so that crisis, you know, is definitely on Shaulullah's mind. Perhaps uh, this perhaps is one of the reasons why he leaves um, to Mecca. Um, this is the extent of the Mughal Empire when Shaulila leaves, uh, uh, you know, you know, to Mecca and Medina. Um, but before that, you know, I just want to spend some time speaking about Shaulila's education. So, as I said, his father uh, was a great alim, Shah Abdul Rahim, a great Sufi as well. Um, uh, Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb had actually given his father a grant, which known, which what's known as a mansab or a madad -e maash, which is a form of waqf. And so, basically, the income of this land would go to a specific scholarly family. Hundreds of families. I mean, in fact, Akbar, the great Mughal king, Akbar, distributed many of these grants um, to many, many ulama and qadis because obviously that also led to the functioning of the empire. The only law of the empire. Um, for actually, for all of these Islamic empires, as Allah has, has written in the Sharia theory, practice of transformations, was really just the Sharia. So obviously, you, you need to train qadis, you need to train muftis, who are sort of the legal um, jurisprudence and the and the and the muftis of the empire. And um, and so uh, we have a biography of Shaulullah like, called Ajus al Latif fi Hal al Abd al Daif, and uh, he sort of talks about his own educational background. And it's phenomenal. Because by the age of about 15, 16, Shaulullah is an alim. So he would have known Arabic, Persian, uh, 
proto urdu urdu obviously wasn't a language then for those who might know the first urdu book that is written is in the year 1780 so urdu is actually a little bit younger than america itself uh which is always a very interesting anecdote um but also um Shawlullah's father taught him you know fiqh uh, hadith obviously at that time in india the highest hadith that you studied was mishkat so not too much in hadith some tafsir of jalalain of baydawi a lot of mantiq um, which is logic, a lot of kalam, which is Islamic theology, a lot of Imam Razi, um, a lot of, of, of the great Shia philosopher Mullah Sadra um, was taught to Shawalullah and really all of the ulama. And by the way, to be an alim by the age of 15 or 16 was actually not that unique. Um, I would say it was actually pretty standard. Um, obviously, pedagogy was a lot more sophisticated and uh, much more robust back then. You know, you would know you, you could read and write Persian and Arabic by the age of eight or nine. Um, from what I can tell by Mughal Tabaqat, their uh, biographical works. And uh, also his father, very interestingly, taught him very advanced Tasawwuf Kitabs at a very young age, uh, namely Ibn Arabi and Ahmed Sirhindi, whom, whom we'll talk about um, a little bit later. But anyways, in the year 1728, 1729, Shaululah is about 25, 26 years old. He's been teaching in the, in the madrasa that his father has est had established called uh, Madrasa Rahimiyya in Delhi. Unfortunately, it was destroyed um, in the in the in the British uh, sort of crackdown in 1857, um, although there's a sort of replica of that building today. And um, anyway, Shaulila leaves um, Delhi. He goes to you can see uh, Bombay here, not Bombay, sorry, Surat, uh, Baraj Surat, and he goes there by land. And this is sort of the way that people go to Hajj. He goes and then shout from Surat into into uh, what is mo modern day Jeddah, and then he uh, obviously, you know, takes a caravan into Mecca and Medina. He spends about a year and a half. And this is really, really important because remember in, in Mughal India, as in the Ottoman Empire, especially in the sort of non-Arab lands, it was really just the Hanafi madhab. Everyone was Hanafi. Everyone was Maturidi, unless, you know, obviously you were Shia. And, um, you know, there's a very specific curriculum that you were taught. Fiqhan, Kalaman, Usulan, Tafsiran, etc. You know, um, you know, issues of that you don't you don't read Fatiha behind the Imam, you don't see Amin out loud, etc. You know, you don't um, you know you don't uh, uh, sort of engage in certain financial practices that are of of difference between the Hanafi and the Shafi'i madhabs. But anyway, when Shaulullah travels to Mecca and Medina, he has a sort of not epiphany, I would say, but really intellectual awakening. You can say a second intellectual awakening where he studies with scholars in Medina and Mecca, namely Kurdish and Moroccan scholars, I would say. When I when I looked at a lot of his teachers, he has a book on all of his teachers, Qurratul A'yun, um, Fi Mashayikh al um, Many of his teachers were Moroccan, many of his teachers were Kurdish. His major teachers, Ibrahim, um, uh, Abu Tahr al Kurdi, and Ibrahim al Qurani. And uh, what they do is they introduce uh, Shaulullah to many different spheres of knowledge that were not active. Um, in South Asia. Namely, most importantly, as, as we know about, is the study of hadith. Uh, so Imam Shaulullah mentions uh, in a book called Adurra Thameen how he studied sort of the Siha Sitta and many other great books of hadith. Uh, so the Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan al-Tirmadhi, Sunan ibn Majah, Sunan Nisai, Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, Sunan al-Darami, the Musadraq of Hakim, um, and other great works. But also he studies uh, the Sawaf Kitab. So he says, so he sort of says with Shabri Sheikhs. So this is the first time really we see a sort of interaction between the Shabri Tariqa and the and the South Asian Naqshbandi and Chishti uh, sort of tariqas. Uh, obviously, Shaulila becomes very enchanted with the with the even Malik. He sort of sees it as as I would say, in fact, more than Bukhari. He sees the Mutta Imam Malik as the most sacred text um, after the Quran. Um, as many many Maliki scholars do of, of West Africa and North Africa, and this is very interesting because they because they Bandis, Brailvis, and Ahlul Hadith all in South Asia, and in fact Islamic modernists like Maududi and others all take their knowledge from Shaulullah. So Shaulullah becomes the fount of which all of these various South Asian groups sort of derive their epistemology and their tradition from, and so Shaulullah becomes that fountainhead, right? And he's only 27, 28 years old. Um, obviously, the Ottomans are ruling Mecca and Medina. Um, he mentions, you know, some some anecdotes vis-a-vis -vis that we don't have time to share um, in his Budur al Uh, But again, he has this incredible, incredible uh, reckoning, right? Because obviously, he's he grows up as a very staunch Hanafi. But now, all of his teachers are either Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali. Um, also, in in Mecca and Medina, Shalila is introduced to an amazing sort of uh, intellectual of the Ummah, namely Ibn Taymiyyah. Um, Shabulila becomes very, not obsessed, but very also enchanted by Ibn Taymiyyah um, as, 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 as a mujaddid. We have a letter of Shabulila 
um, in Arabic and in Persian sort of defending Ibn Taymiyyah against some of the Hanafis um, in the 1750s in Mughal Delhi. And from what I can tell, he's the first South Asian scholar that sort of um, really, really uh, validates Ibn Taymiyyah's message. But what's also very fascinating is that Shaul is also very, very loyal to Ibn Arabi and Ahmed Sirhindi. And we can say that Shaul is also not only the first person to synthesize um, uh, Ibn Arabi and Ibn Taymiyyah, he's also the first person to synthesize Ibn, Arab, uh, Ibn Arabi and Ahmed Sirhindi. Um, as I, I don't know if Usad Abu Ayyub mentioned, but obviously um, the only major sort of construction that happened um, uh, uh, after Ibn Arabi happened in India from Ahmed Sir Hindi who established Wahdatul Shuhud versus Wahdatul Wujud. Um, I'll go into a little bit uh, uh, that later with, with some of these slides. Um, but um, so they uh, uh, sort of all become synthesized in the system of Shaulullah. And that's really um, one of the major geniuses of Shaulullah is that he's able to synthesize so many various and so many disparate figures. In fact, he wrote two books um, on ikhtilaf in terms of uh, um, very famous book where he was trying, trying to reckon that why is there ikhtilaf in the ummah, right? Like why are there multiple sort of, um, you know, methods by which people engage uh, tradition, they engage fiqh, engage aqidah, engage kalam. If we all follow one religion, what is the hikmah, what is the underlying wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing multiple schools of legal thought, multiple schools of theological thought, multiple schools of Sufi thought, obviously, you know, the Naqshbandis, uh, the Chishti, the Suharwardis, the Qadri, the Shadris, all of them are sort of in the climate of Shawalula. So he has this, you know, real reckoning. Also the reckoning of that the Hanafis, um, remembering that Imam Bukhari is from uh, a very Hanafi land. Imam Bukhari, right, was born a Hanafi and leaves the Hanafi madhab, sort of either becomes Shafi or establishes his own madhab, depending on which muhaddith view that you take. Um, but even though Bukhara and Samarqand are 100% Hanafi cities, and they still are today, nobody took Imam Bukhari seriously in Samarqand or Bukhara in any Hanafi land except for some of the Arab lands up until Shaulullah, which is absolutely wild to think about. Samarqand and Bukhara did not take Imam Bukhari seriously as a muhaddith because the Hanafis obviously had their own major tradition of hadith. So now Shaulullah is reckoning with the fact that Imam, that you know, you have the Sahih of Bukhari, that you know, many of the rulings of the Hanafi madhab, many of the rulings of Sayyidina. Ali and Sayyidina Abdul Mas'ud are not recorded in Bukhari, right? So he has this sort of um, engagement with, um, with the Hadith tradition. Now, he only spends about a year and a half in Medina and Mecca, but it's an incredible, incredible intellectual awakening. I mean, in that year and a half, I mean, uh, you know, when I, was in, when I was in Madras in South Africa, we did Bukhari, um, just, just I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, right? That every single Malana from Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh for the past 240 years all of their silsilas goes to this one person, namely Shaulullah. Um, if we had more time, I, I would read through his sanad, but um, we don't really have time for that today. Um, but it's truly something to think about, right? And he was only 28, 29 when he went. Um, but again, so, so he's, he's, he's bringing all of these spheres of knowledge um, back to Mughal India, which is suffering through many, many political crises. As I said, um, uh, these, uh, these Mughal kings, you know, about if you see the bottom row of four to five, Shalila witnesses the death of all four or five of them. And in fact, the one on the bottom right, Farooq Siyar, Farooq Siyar is actually killed by two Sayyid nobles and he's thrown onto the street dead, right? And this is the first time Mughal king has been killed like that, right? Usually he's killed by his own brother, but this time he's killed by a non, a person from, from who's not from the royal family, right? And um, so we're going to talk about some of his political views as well. Um, and uh, so intellectually, this is his, his intellectual sort of genealogy in India. So you have Shaulullah through his father, Shah Abdul Rahim. You have Mira Zahid, who wrote a, a great mantaq book, Mira Zahid al Harawi, which is from Herat in Afghanistan, Mullah Muhammad Yusuf, Mira Zajan Shirazi, Wajihuddin Gujarati, Ahmaduddin Tari, uh, uh, Tarimi, and Jalaluddin Dawani. To, um, Jalaluddin Dawani, by the way, is this famous um, Sunni Iranian scholar who was exiled by Shah Ismail, sort of moved to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but anyways, this is the, this is the intellectual genealogy of Shaulila. Um, these are some of the books that Shaulila wrote. Um, I just want to go through some of them. So you have al Tafal Quds, uh, which is his sort of approach to, uh, I would say, metaphysics and psychology. So he's, he, he sort of unveils that what is the ruh, what is the aqal, what is the qalb, what is the nafs, what do all of these concepts mean? And he's trying to bring in, again, Ibn Ar that's mainly Ibn Arabi and Ahmed Sirhindi and Imam Ghazali and bringing them all together in dialogue and conversation and trying to define terms. You have Anfas al Arifin, which is a reflection and, and, and stories from his father about various Sufi mashayikh of South Asia. 
We have Bidur al Bazika, which is actually the last or second to last book that he wrote. Um, it's a book about psychology. It's a book about Nubuwa or prophecy. It's a book about wisdom. Um, it's incredible, incredible. Oh my God. If you guys have ever read um, Plato's uh, Republic, it's sort of in that format, not, not in the sort of Socratic question, uh, you know, question and answer sort of thing, but in the same way of addressing sort of um, opposing arguments and trying to build a whole system of metaphysics and philosophy and wisdom into one book. Phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, also, Shaulullah in India was the first person to translate the Quran into Persian. Um, um, I have that too. Fatah Rahman bi Tarjumat al Quran. He also wrote a book on Usul al Tafsir, the methodology of Tafsir, Al Fazl al Kabir fi Usul al Tafsir. He has a book called Fiyud al Haramain, which are all the dreams that he had in Mecca and Medina. Um, when when we when you when we graduate as Mulan as a madrasa at the end of our six year course, um, we finish Bukhari and then we just read some of the dreams of of Shaulullah on Fiyud al Haramain. He has a very interesting reflection on the Mawla that he attended in Mecca. Um, you know, it's a wild sort of uh, image to think about celebrating the Mawlid publicly in, in Mecca Mukarrama, but you know, back then it was a public holiday. Um, Hajjatullah al-Baligha is his most famous work. Um, this is the book that, that we study at Darul Qasim with Sheikh Amin. Um, it's, about, it's about sociology, wisdom, metaphysics, sort of the wisdom, you know, um, this is from a very Matabidi perspective, i.e. that every single action um, whether ritual or otherwise in Islam has an underlying wisdom and what is that wisdom, but metaphysically. So, so Sarshalia starts with the first 200 pages um, with just one of the meta metaphysics of the world. He outlines a hierarchy of this world, um, Jabarut, Malakut, Lahut, Nasut, um, Alam al-Mithal, um, et cetera, the world of dreams, the world of symbols, the higher realms, the Malakul A'la, Hadir al quds what is the relationship with human beings and angels? What is the relationship with human beings and prophets? Why does Allah send prophets, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth? Um, this is, um, I mean, a text. Um, I'm going to ask Satarbai if we can do a class with you guys just on one chapter, just for you guys to sort of see um, his most famous book. This book, um, he has two books on ikhtilaf, uh, i.e., that why are there differences of imams, of fiqh, of tasawwuf, and theology? Um, you have um, so two books, Irshad ila muhimmat al al So this is a book on uh, sanad or uh, on, on the on the hadith tradition. Izalat al khafa and khilafat al khulafa. Um, near the end of Shaulullah's life, um, because of multiple uh, Shia wazirs who were sort of migrating into India, Shaulullah wrote a 400-page book in Farsi, or rather 500 pages, on why Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar are superior to Sayyidina Uthman and Sayyidina Ali. And he makes this argument that Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar are the jawarih of the Prophet, the, i.e. that they're the limbs of the Prophet, and they that although the Prophet's um, knowledge and wahi is complete, alayhi salatu wasalam, that these two Sahaba sort of complete that mission. So he spent about 400 to 500 pages discussing this in Persian. And then he has his autobiography, Al-Juz'ul Latifi Tarjimati Abdaif. And then you have uh, Al-Khairul Kathir, which is also a book of metaphysics. It's a little bit more advanced from his Altaf Al-Quds. Actually, his son, who's the last Grand Mufti of, uh, the grand, the last Grand Mufti of India and of Mughal Delhi, uh, Shah Abdul Aziz Dahlawi and Mufti Sadduddin Azurda, they sort of mention how Khairul Kathir is actually um, if you want to read Imam Ghazali, um, because Imam Ghazali has some conflicting and some unclear positions, Khair al Kathir and Ataf al Quds are actually a better summary because it's later and because Shaulullah is sort of again synthesizing Imam Ghazali, Imam Razi, Ahmed Sir Hindi, and Ibn Arabi into one philosophical system. Um, Shaulullah wrote two commentaries on the Mutlai Mamalik. He wrote, on Imam Bukhari, he only wrote a commentary on the chapter headings, but the Mutlai Mamalik, he wrote one commentary in Arabic and one commentary in Persian. Because remember, two Shaulullah. The Mutlai Mamalik is the most sacred text in Islam after the Quran. Also, we have his maktubat or his letters, political letters, and otherwise. Uh, he wrote a second book, Qurratul Ainin fi Tabdil al Shaykhain, or a book on why Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar are superior, you know, the coolness of the eyes and the priority of the Shaykhain, which are said. Um, you have Lamahat and Sata'at, um, which are also uh, books on metaphysics and philosophy. Um, you have obviously, as I mentioned, Sharh Tarajim Abu Abdul Bukhari commentary on the chapter headings of Bukhari. You have Tafimatul Ilahiya, personally, my favorite book of Shaulullah. Um, again, just some of his reflections are sort of like epiphanies that he has. Um, so, so beautiful. Oh my God, it's a 300 page book, half Arabic, half Persian. I went through it twice last summer. Um, uh, some, some parts are, are, are sort of vague to me, but incre truly, um, and just a reflection. I mean, um, I, I, I personally don't think that any, anybody as brilliant as Shaulullah has, has been born in the Ummah from the time that he's died, um, just because he was, because he came 
so much later and he was able to sort of read and synthesize and study everything and i just don't believe that you know people have uh, have, have have not been able to do what what, what, he, what he was and i think that brilliance is really seen in tafimat uh, al-ilahiyya this is a book that was printed in 1886 1886 um, in calcutta um in safi bayan sabal ikhtilaf, uh, ikhtilaf um, as i mentioned uh, this is the book I mentioned, Hajjat Allah uh, al he, 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 as I said, metaphysics, philosophy, sociology. Um, what's very interesting is that uh, something that I'm trying to explore is if he, if he ever read Ibn Khaldun. From what it seems like he doesn't, because he never quotes him, but a lot of his conclusions seem to be parallel to Ibn Khaldun. But although because Shaulullah is more studied in metaphysics and philosophy, he's able to take some of the sociology arguments a lot larger. So, for, so for example, one of the major sort of... Um, arguments that he presents in the book is that all of human civilization um, is can be divided into four categories, namely uh, that what's what he calls the irtifaqat or uh, different stages of human development, et cetera. And, um, you know, so you have the fourth one, which is the hunter gatherer. Then you have the second, which is a basic city, which is a basic sort of village. The third is a city state. And the fourth um, is a sort of city empire, city state that, that you can call. But he also talks about the development of prophecy um, namely between Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Badrul Bazigha. Um, I'm going to go through a passage just so you can see sort of what he's talking about. So he so he's having a discussion on why the prophets are superior to Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and, and Plotinus. Um, so I'm going to read through. So he, he goes through some of the major attributes of, of, of these prophets. Um, and then he sort of draws conclusions. This is at the end of Budur al Bazigha in the Hakim or the wisdom section. So he says, Women khasiyatihi al kamal. So one of the major attributes of the Prophet is that they're kamil. Right? That the Prophets are kamil, i.e., that they're, mo that they're most perfect in terms of internal character and external character. And they have many incidents of divine sort of conditions. And sort of divine epiphanies, and again sacred dreams. A prophet is can also be a hakim. And he can also be hakim, i.e., that he's most knowledgeable about sort of ethics and the second and third stage of civilization and its mannerisms. And he's also a khalifa. And he's also a khalifa, that he's most knowledgeable about political theory, divine kingship. Shahriyariya comes from the Persian word Shahriyar. Shahriyar, the friend of the city, became king. And then he put it into air, he airbized it, shahriyariya, i.e., political kingship, um, well, qadai, so, and again, warfare, law, etc., etc. A prophet is also hadi, he's also a guide. Right? 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 Right, and that he's also a hadi, that he has companions around him who um, who reach through him. So you have the Sahaba and the Ahlul Bayt who reach the highest forms of excellence and, and purity through the Prophet, and they and they teach them signs, etc., etc. And they and and he has an impactful sort of advice um, in in hearts of people and accepted prayer and supplications. And he commands good and forbids evil. I, he spreads the values of Islam. Umin khasiyati al imam. He's also an imam, right? Talking about these are all obviously words that are used um, for different prophets in the Quran. So for Khalifa, Allah says, you know, in Najjal and the Khalifa for Hakim. You know, Allah talks about how 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 um, innahu awab al Hakim. Allah talks how Ibrahim alayhi salam is awab, right? He's constantly repent, repenting and Hakim. Allah talks about Khalifa, uh, or Allah talks about al Hadi, right? How Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam is a Hadi. Um, also, um, uh, uh, al Imam, right? Allah calls uh, uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim um, an Imam, right? Tabir Ibrahima, Millet Ibrahima Hanifa, Makanim and Mushrikin, etc. Well, I could have been at Alamanesi with the Shri or Kawadi or Dobiti with the Rusum Salih, however, with the Riki Jal and Haki Marcusi at the Hananasi Amatan. Why in Zara Ali Kitabu Minallah Tala, you could the Sun and Nasi Kati Bu, the Almi Mili, where the Afim and Kasiati. So, and then he's also an Imam, but he's the most knowledgeable about the Islamic or rather the divine law and its principles and its theory, right? So Shalwi was very sort of interested in sort of the, 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 the theoretical aspects of things. 
um, and, 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 and how to make and how to make truth established and fortified in the minds of people uh, collectively and globally. And also a, a book of Allah is, is sort of descends upon them. So it becomes a law for people. It becomes a poll and a knowledge of various religions, etc. He's also a warner. And he's also a warner that he's most knowledgeable about the fitan or the tribulations, right? And the evil of shaitan and the signs and the knowledge of qiyamah and its signs. And he's also a shaheed. Right, he's also the most knowledgeable about the different stages of people um, in terms of how do they reach their excellence and, and, and the rewards of actions and, and the consequences of actions, good and evil, etc., etc. And then at the end, he says, إِذَا um, عَلِمْتَ بمراتب الأنبياء وكمالهم وصفا فمالك فمالك right لا لا تعرفون بأعيانهم فعلم أن موسى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم جمع أكثر هذه الأوصاف فكان كاملين حكيمين خليفتين هادين من 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 منذرين شهيدين إمامين وكان من أعلم الأنبياء يعلم كل سنف وبلغ في التشريع وضبط قوانينه أرفع الدرجات وأحاط بأسراره uh, right, and then he mentions, you know, Wakana um, Iskandar Khalifa. So he mentions that the Holy Prophet and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam, but they combined all of these traits. I actually cut out the last sort of line of this, but basically he says that none of these Greek philosophers. Um, like Aristotle or Socrates, even had one of these traits. They were neither kabinet, they were neither hakim, they were not a khalifa, they were not a hadi, they were not a mundar, they were not shaheed, and they were not imams. And so sort of wants to prove um, uh, uh, inductively why prophets are superior to great philosophers. But again, this is less than, less. this is less than 0.1% of Shaul is brilliant. This is just a, a brief glance. Um, we probably don't have time. I wanted to go into... Um, you know, uh, Sitar, I said 40 to 45 minutes. So I wanted to go into some political thought, but this is more of a metaphysics. You know, he goes into ru the ruh, the qalb, the nafs, the intellect, and the sir. He has some, he has, um, he quotes Imam Ghazali, but he takes Imam Ghazali a lot further. Um, I would say that Imam Shaulullah, if you look at Imam Ghazali's thought and Shaulullah's thought, I would say Shaulullah's thought is probably five times the thought of Shaulullah. And I don't say that lightly, by the way. Again, the ruh, the, the nafs, the nasama, et cetera. Um, this is his hierarchy um, in English. So you have, um, so this is the psychology of Shaoliola. So for psychology, and nobody I think has done anything with it other than Sheikh Amina Dar al Qasim. Uh, but uh, the psychology of Shaoliola, again, is a very spiritual psychology. It's very bodily. He starts off with the five senses, as you can see, all the way on the bottom. But you have all of these multiple realms, right, in which um, a Muslim lives and exists. So for Shaulila, any spiritual, any psychological, really even any medical approach must account for all of this. So here, Shaul, so you can see Shaulila's theory of the subtle spiritual centers, what he calls the lata'if, um, which are, you know, very interesting because, you know, Shaulila has this reflection is that, and he's taking from Imam Ghazali here, that when people talk about the qalb or the heart, they think it's like the cone-shaped organ in the body. But when we talk about the heart, we really mean the ruh, and it's a spiritual center that links a human being to, to the multiple realms in which every, every Muslim and every non-Muslim really lives and occupies, right? So you have the sir, which is the secret, or, or the akhfa sir, which is the most secret or the most occult of secrets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, this is also a really sort of interesting diagram that I found. Um, but again, this is sort of Shaulullah is bringing right all of these various figures into conversation and developing a whole metaphysical philosophical so sociological and um uh, uh, psychological system into sort of one um uh, uh, uh sort of program and project so this is all based on his here, which as i said is my favorite book very understudied um you know i was talking to uh, someone recently and i was in and i and i thought it was so sad um you know that pakistan as a country and even Bangladesh, you know, that of which who 
who are inheritors of Shawaliula did not take any of this stuff seriously. Uh, which is really, really a tragedy because in my, again, estimation that I don't think that any Muslim thinker even comes close to Shabaliula in any, any, really any of his projects. Um, this is another of diagrams. Um, just some, some political stuff, um, if I can. So uh, this is, you know, you, you, you guys saw that, that image of Mughal India in 1707 when, when Aurangzeb passes away. By when 1765, this is just three years after Shaulila's death, you can see India, just the green as Muslim areas. Um, so you have the Nizam of Hyderabad, you have Tipu Sultan in Mysore, um, you have Kashmir, you have Lucknow. Um, Bengal has been taken by the East India Trading Company. The Marathas have taken over, the Sikhs have taken over a lot of Punjab. Um, Sim, from my knowledge, is still Muslim. So obviously there's a lot going on. And so I don't want people to think that Shaulila was just um, a, uh, uh, an Islamic philosophical thinker because he was also a political thinker. We have about 400, 500 letters to various political Muslim rulers in South Asia and Afghanistan. And um, so you can see here, the major sort of alternate power is the Maratha empire. So Shaoliwala writes a letter to various Muslim leaders in South Asia and in the Nizam of Hyderabad, to Tipu Sultan's father, Haider Ali, uh, to the Nawab of Lucknow, um, and he says that, listen, like, can you guys sort of try to handle this Hindu threat? And they're not really able to. And uh, so Shaulila writes a letter to the king of Afghanistan, which I'm going to translate it from, uh, from Farsi into English, which I, I will read to you. O kings, mala'ul a'la. Mala'ul a'la, this is that verse in the of Surah Jinn, right? So the mala'ul a'la in Shaulila's hierarchy, taking from Imam Razi, is it's the highest heavens where namely the 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 most elite arch angels live so then jibil so then israel so then israfi so then mikal alayhi salam this is um again this is based off many many ahadith that i'm not going to go into but shalila says oh kings mala'ul a'la the highest heaven urges you to draw your swords and to not put them back into their sheets again until allah has separated the muslims from the polytheists and the rebellious kafirs and the sinners are made absolutely feeble and helpless in a testament to sayyidina ubar uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr had informed him that if he feared Allah, the entire world would be frightened of him. Sages declared that the world resembled a shadow. If a man ran after his shadow, it would pursue him. And if he took flight from the shadow, it would still pursue him. Allah has chosen you, or God has chosen you as a protector of the Sunnis, and there is no one else to perform this duty. He's telling the Afghan king, Ahmad Shah Durrani, Ahmad Shah Abdali, to perform this duty. It is crucial that you, at all times, you consider your role, this role as obligatory, farat kifaya by taking up the sword to make Islam supreme, by subordinating your own pers personal needs to this cause, you will reap vast be benefits. We beseech you, Durrani, in the name of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so we know Shalila did the wasal. We beseech you, O Durrani, in the name of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to fight a war against the infidels of this region. This would entitle you to great rewards before Allah, the Most High, and your name would be included in the list of those who fought jihad for his sake. As far as worldly gains are concerned, incalculable booty would fall into the hands of the Islamic Ghazis and the Muslims would be liberated from their bonds. The invasion of Nadir Shah who destroyed the Muslims left the Marathas and the Juts secure and prosperous. This resulted in the infidels regaining their strength and the reduction of Muslim leaders of Delhi to mere puppets. When the conquering army arrives in the area with a mixed Muslim Hindu population, the imperial guard should transfer the Muslims from their villages to the towns and at the same time care for their property. Financial assistance should be given to, by governments to the deprived and the poor, as well as to the Sayyids and the ulama. The generosity would then become famous with the prompt prayers for their, uh, for their victories. Um, Moreover, moreover, wherever there is even the status fear of a Muslim defeat, the Islamic army should be there to disperse infidels to all corners of the earth. Um, so it's actually very interesting is that Ahmad Shah Durrani rides with an army of 70,000 Afghans. He rides from Kandahar to Kabul, Kabul to Peshawar, Peshawar to Lahore, Lahore to Amritsar, Amritsar to Delhi. And they camp outside of Panipat, which is also where famously the first Mughal king defeats the Afghan king. And Ahmad Shah Abdi defeats a 300,000 army. And this is actually the last time that Muslims actually win a victory other than Tipu Sultan's two major, uh, two minor victories um, in the late uh, 1780s that George Washington uh, was actually rooting for um, and Thomas Jefferson. And um, so, uh, but he, with a 70,000 Afghan army, he destroys a 300,000 Maratha army. So much so the Marathas are sort of almost paralyzed for the next 10, 15 years. And uh, this actually is sort of allows the British to sort of take over. But Shaulullah tells Ahmad Shah Abdali to stay. But Ahmad Shah Abdali says that India is too hot. <laughs> so he goes back to Afghanistan. Finally, um, I wanted, so Shaulullah wrote a wasiyah. 
And um, in this we'll see, he wrote about 14 we'll see yet. Um, I don't know if I'm about to say this, but I think me and Abdus Sattar are actually working on translating it. But I wanted just to read two. He wrote about 14. A lot of it's about pedagogy. A lot of it is about um, sort of, um, you know, education for Muslims in India, intellectual history, what to teach. But I wanted to read two of the more emotional ones. So he says, Wasiyate digar ma mardume gharibim ke dar diyar hindustan abai ma ba ghurbat uftadan wa ghurbat nasa ba ghurbat lisan har do fakhri mas ke ma sayyid awwalin wa akhirin wa afdal anbiya wa muslim wa fakhri mawjudat alayhi wa alihi as-salawat wa taslim nazdi ke ma gardan shukri in ni'mat azma anas ke ba qadr imkan aadat wa rusum arab awwal ke man shay hazrat ahan sallallahu alayhi wasallam arzus so he says that i am an exile that my family came as exiles into Mughal India and we fell into Ghurbat. Ghurbat he doesn't mean poverty. He means, ex, you know, being an exile in the state of exile. And he says that, you know, the, the language of Arabic is an incredible uh, source of pride because it links me to the master of both worlds, the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the study of Arabic is crucial because it links you to the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and again, he has some other sort of reflection in the study of Arabic. Um, this is his final wasiya, which I love, and it, and it breaks me every time that I read it. Uh, he says, so he probably wrote this in 1761, 1762, a couple, a couple of weeks before he died. He says, um, uh, uh, that it, it, it comes in the hadith that uh, whoever, so, so he's quoting um, uh, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that um, which, sorry, just thinking a lot about Shelly right now, but um, which, whichever one of you, um, uh, which, whichever one of you meets Isa the son of Maryam, he should um, convey my salam to uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. So this, this hadith comes, I believe, in the Mustadrak of Imam Hakim. Um, and this is very interesting, right? Because a lot of us are, uh, are um, you know, like, I can't wait for Imam Mahdi to come or Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam um, to, to, to sort of come and, you know, you, you want to see it like that, that, uh, that, that peace and like joy of the world, which is like obviously very natural. But what's, what's, what's very interesting is that, um, you know, uh, um, he, he said that it's, um, you know, he says, in faqira arzui tamam darat, agar ayyami hazrati ruhullah dar yabad awwal kasi ke tablighi salam kuna man. You know that, that, oh Allah, that I hope that um, I am the first person who can, um, convey the salams of the Holy Prophet to uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, you know, and then at the end he says that um, uh, uh, that I hope that me or sorry about that, um, that I hope that one of me or um, one of my family members would sort of convey that salam and that would also sort of join that army and um, of Imam Mahdi and Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam and um, so that's his last. So then he says, you know, as kutabi Muhammadiyya ma basham that I would be the from you know from the army or the lashkar of Muhammad But this is a translation of that second wasiya uh, that I read to you. I sort of translated it fast, but as you can see here, and then sort of the end when the east. The East India Trading Company actually um, take over just three years um, after Shatwiwa's death, which is metaphysically very, very interesting. Um, I always end with this ruba'i of Iqbal in, in, uh, in, in Persian, where this is also um, Iqbal's, from Iqbal's last production, his Anmaghani uh, Hijaz, or the Gifts of the Hijaz, Unfortunately, Iqbal was not able to do Umrah or Hajj, so he wrote this uh, book hoping that it would be this like presentation of his poetry in Medina and Mecca. So Iqbal says, 
سرود رفت باز آید که نه آید و the old song of Islam ever come back again um, سر آمد سر آمد روزگاری این فقیری that the time for this Sufi has come to go دیگر دنای راز آید که نه آید will another uh, keeper of secrets come again and what's actually very interesting um, is that شو in شو in اخبار's uh, last Uh, last philosophical book that he wrote, um, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, he said that the only figure um, um, of the past two centuries who was able to sort of, you know, uproot Islam um, in its foundations, but also sort of like rethink it was uh, Shah Waliullah. So that's, you know, Iqbal was obviously, you know, a great reader um, of the past. But uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and stop there. Jazakallah khair for having me. Um, let me stop sharing. If you guys have any questions, we can go ahead and take them. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan. Jazakallah khairan, Ustad. Um, any questions? I think I, there's some in the chat. Uh, Bismillah, you can, uh, you know, you can answer as you like, inshallah. Yeah, um, the, so the, the last poem again, Surude Rafta from Allah Iqbal, the great poet from Sialkot. Surude Rafta Baz Ayat Kina Ayat, will the old song of Islam ever come back again? Nasimi as Hijaz Ayat Kina Ayat, that will the, will the breeze from the Prophet's land ever, you know, sort of blow towards us in, in, in India? Um, the time for this Sufi has come to go, i.e. Iqbal. Um, will another keeper of secrets ever come again? Who knows the secrets of Islam? Um, next question, what level do we need to be in order to study Hajjullah um, al I'm a student of Sheikh Amin, so I'm going to say that you need to finish Alam course. And truthfully, the only two places in the world that I know that you can study it, or rather three, Um, one is in Chicago here at Laral Qasim, where I studied it with Sheikh Amin Kawadia. Um, by the way, all of this knowledge of Shaulullah um, comes through Sheikh Amin. So I did a six-year Alam course in South Africa. Um, but what you realize is that Alam course doesn't, doesn't even really prepare you for the knowledge of Shaulullah. And he's really opposed to Alam course things. So I would say that after doing Alam course, and I'm sure like there's some, you know, there's some lessons that you might be able to take, but the reality is that Shaulullah wrote a lot of these books for ulama to sort of, spread and propagate and it's very very theoretical and very very abstract um but yeah why was he opposed to all in courses uh he was not opposed to all in courses would the conclusive argument from god by hermanson yeah um it's a good transition but again i mean if you don't have because he's synthesizing so much philosophy and so much you know sort of Um, Aristotelian and Mullah Sadra and Imam Ghazali and all of them into one system, unless you're familiar with all of this stuff, um, especially Imam, um, Imam Jurjani's Sheikh al-Mawaqif, it's going to be very, very challenging to understand. Um, in his political writing, should Shalila connect to Muhammad al-Wahab in terms of supporting Muhammad as the arguments could put forth? Very, very good question. Um, so what's very interesting is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is in Medina and Mecca around the same time as Shah Waliullah. which is kind of crazy. Uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab's main teacher is Sheikh Hayat Sindhi, who is a South Asian scholar who, um, you know, sort of also moves from Mughal Sin to the Haramain. And in this climate of Ottoman Mecca and Ottoman Medina, there is this emphasis on hadith. Now, I have, I'd say I've read about 80, 85% of Shaulullah's works. Um, I think it's fair to say that there is some hadith-based approach where Shaulullah is sort of Um, stepping away from some Hanafi fiqh rulings to following hadith in the Mutla Imam Malik and the Sahih of Bukhari. But he is not, the, I think it's absolutely an unfair comparison that just because of one or two things that him and Muhammad Abdul Wahab might have aligned on to say that he was somehow anticipating Wahhabism and Salafism, he did advocate for hadith, but he also advocated more so for, for tasawwuf, for the, for the turuq. Um, especially for the Qadris and the Naqshbandis. Um, he has many, many books on this. Um, and uh, so it would be, you know, really, really reductive and academically dishonest to say that his entire system is taking 
hadith and putting it in dialogue with falsafa, with hikmah, with tasawwuf and creating a holistic system. Yeah, that also means that he's also reviving hadith as well. But just to say that that's, and just to sort of um, reduce him to that, I think is incredibly dishonest, which is what people are doing. And again, people don't understand philosophy and wisdom in tasawwuf. So they only read his hadith stuff and they sort of uh, uh, misconstrue him because of that. Gonna pay Maghrib. Good, I'm glad that you prayed Maghrib. Where can we get these diagrams? Unfortunately, cannot share them. Do you, do you know Persian? Do you remember? Know? Yes, absolutely. Persian is a second language of Islam. Um, one of the major reasons why many Muslims today are, are sort of diver, divorced from their intellectual past is because of the loss of Persian. Imam Ghazali wrote so many books in Persian. Imam Razi wrote so many books in Persian. Imam, Bukhari, Imam Bukhari's native language himself was Persian. Imam Muslims' major language is Persian. Imam Abu Dawood's major language is Persian. Imam Tirmidhi's major language is Persian. So Imam Rumi, Shams al Tabriz, um, Abdul Qadir Jilani was obviously Persian. Um, you know, uh, Mullah Sadra, Mir Damad, Shah Abdul Aziz, obviously, Mullah Qasim Nanotui. I mean, all of these major, major figures wrote, wrote in Persian. Where can we get the recording from? Not sure. Um, yeah. Aren't some of the works she'll be tampered by they mean followers since there are some contradictions in some of his works. Um, we have hit some of his own like handwritten manuscripts. Um, I think that some ulama who didn't understand a lot, again, a lot of Shalullah's metaphysics and ontology just tried to say that to sort of um, defend him against this Wahhabi critique. But if they had just read all of his works, they didn't need to sort of put it forth the flutist claim that his works were tampered with. So again, again, this is just comes from a poor reading of the Torah, which, um, you know, you guys should look at Taha Rahman when you guys can. Um, yeah. Zishan said that we want to see my video. Sorry, um, I only have an iPad, my laptop broke, unfortunately. So when I shared, um, it, only, it, it only shows a screen, but yeah. From the audience. What should one study after Shah al in order to get a better understanding of Islamic metaphysics worldview? Um, Shah al-Mawaqif of Durjani will give you an incredible, incredible thing. And uh, Mullah Sadra. If you can study these two things, there's a really good uh, book. Uh, man, what's his name? Uh, he's an academic in England. Um, he, uh, I believe, at University of Exeter. He has some great works on Mullah Sadra. If you, if you can understand Mullah Sadra and Sheikh from Durjani, um, I feel like you can sort of approach Shaulia. But again, remember Shaulia is also a muhaddid, right? And he's also a faqih. So you, you're also going to miss out on his knowledge of hadith um, uh, and fiqh if you don't know hadith and fiqh, which is why up until the early, mid 20th century, they would teach Shaulia um, in Madaris in South Asia and in Pakistan after Alam course. Because again, he's so holistic and he's so interdisciplinary. What is your opinion of the translation of Shaulia by Jilboni? They're a good start. Um, but again, he, he takes some liberties with some translations. I use some of his translations time to time if I don't understand a passage. Um, but again, obviously the Arabic and the Persian are elite. But again, if you just want to get some sort of um, exposure to him, that's not a bad start. He was a great scholar from Sindh. Um, um, the other scholar besides Mullah Chadra, uh, Sayyid Sharif Jurjani, he was actually the Mutakallam of Taymuri Lang. Sayyid Sharif Jurjani, both Taftazani and Sayyid Sharif Jurjani. So usually... Most kings, they would have a Qazi Askar or military judge, Taymur, the Ottoman kings, the Mughal kings. But what Taymur did was very fascinating was that he also had a Mutkallim Askar or a Hakim Askar. He also had a Mutkallim or a philosopher with his army. But Taymur had major two, namely Taftazani and Sayyid Sharif Durjani. His book called Shah al Mawaqif. Um, from the audience, how much Arabic should you know as a student before pivoting to Persian? The more Arabic you know, the more helpful, but Persian grammar, so between Arabic, Persian, Urdu, and Turkish, Persian is actually the easiest. So uh, Persian is actually maybe two times easier than Urdu as a language grammatically. Sajad Rizvi, yes, thank you so much. Exeter, I, I, I said Exeter, right? Thank you so much, HL Susan. So the Rizvi has some really, really good content on, on uh, Mullah Sadra. So if you want some, if you can't read the Arabic, um, look at Sajad Rizvi. Um, will really, really help you. In his autobiography, Shaulila mentions how his father taught him line by line Mullah Sadra. Shaulila is universally accepted by the major groups of India. They have been really correct. Do they view him as a pillar of Ilm equally in their history? Um, I feel like they have not done justice. Uh, they have and, and the Brave scholars maybe originally did some justice to him. Um, but now they have these Brave and Hadith are very, very reductive. 
to Shao Liola, I think maybe, you know, when I, you know, I spent six years in a Deobundi Madrasa in South Africa and, um, or six year island course, but five years. And, um, you know, we would always hear Shao Liola's name, but we have no idea who he is. And we all know that all are, you know, when, you know, when we finish Bukhari and they say, you know, your, your son of this from, you know, I, and again to uh, Shao Liola, we we get maybe one percent, maybe five percent because of this, you know, unfortunately, could be a few sort of tafsir, but it's really really sad. Um, so yeah, that's that's unfortunate. So yeah, um, do they view him as a pillar? Of, um, uh, do they? I mean, all of their Bukhari sentences go through him. Um, if you look at um, what's his name, Nawab Siddiq Khan, the uh, the, the the famous Salafi of nineteenth century India, obsessed obsessed with Shah Wadiullah. Um, obsessed with Shah Waliullah, the great Hanafi um, Hadith scholar, um, Ahmad Razakhan, Qasim Nanotui, you know, they quote Shah Waliullah extensively, extensively. And there's no doubt that, I mean, he is that singular uniting Jamia figure. And the fact, the fact that he was able to synthesize Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Arabi, and Ahmad Sarhindi into one system, I think is like, you know, no, no words from me can describe <laughs> what, what he was able to do. And but also, but you know, in 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 that tapestry is also Imam Ghazali, Imam Razi, Imam Malik, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and so forth. But yeah, yeah. Um, is that is that it? Sorry, I know I know I went over. I apologize for that. But you know, it's I wanted to hopefully that you get some whispers and glimmers of Shaulila's life. Masha'Allah, Jazakallah khairan. Oh, there's one, looks like one more question. <laughs> um, no, uh, he, he, he was made mainly sitting in Delhi, but as I said, um, he was engaging with various political leaders um, and Aurangzeb has given his father um, a stipend, a family stipend that actually Queen Victoria of England confirms for his son, Shah Abdul Aziz Dahlawi in the 1820s. So, um, but no, no formal administrative role. It was very unusual for an alim to play a role other than established role as an alim because that itself is also an administrative role. If you're an alim in Mughal India, you are basically either a judge or a legal philosopher or a legal advisor. So that's, that would be that administrative role, right? Like this idea of like an alim also is, an, a, you know, as an administrator um, is not, you know, sort of coherent as a question because it's like you already have that role as as that alim right you you have that official rasmi door yeah may we may did anyone comment on the growing influence of the tea company at that time so i've been really diving into it in the beginning of hajjat allah um he he's sitting in pajama masha the mughal belly and he sort of talks about his inspiration for writing this book. And he says that I see the lights rising and being reflected in the West. Now, what that means is anybody's interpretation, but obviously lights rise from the East. So why would he say it's reflected in, or being risen you know, or rising in the West? Um, perhaps he had some ilham. Um, I am going to write an article at some point, inshallah, um, you know, uh, sort of what, how much exposure would Shawila have had to Western thought? Because... Like, why would he write that reflection of the prophets being superior to Greek philosophers um, just coincidentally when the Enlightenment is also happening and there's sort of this neoclassical reviving of Greek civilization is also happening? It's sort of strange. It's not Nobody else is writing about that. And also somehow, you know, Robert Clive, the East India Trading Company is spreading, you know, Enlightenment thought in Bengal at the same time. It's, it's there's there's too many coincidences for Shalila not to have been exposed to some sort of European Enlightenment thought. But again, there needs to be more time. Would you be able to, where can we find your articles? Um, I have not, um, I've only written, um, I, I wrote an, or, an article recently called The Death of Urdu in America for a Traversing Tradition. Um, I have some reflections on Shah Waliullah in there. You guys can read, it's a long, it's a long 70 page article though. Um, but that's, more, I'm trying to reflect on Urdu um, and my sort of laments on Urdu in America. Um, but I have some stuff on Shah Waliullah there. Uh, me and, I don't know if Sotar, but I can say this, me and him are working on some Shah Lula stuff together. So stay tuned for that. Sotar, but if you want to share it, you can go ahead and share it um, and leave that up to you. Um, but yeah. Would you be able to recap in what order of Shah Lula works to be read first before reading Hajjatullah al-Baligha? 
Um, I would say the easiest work to read. His easiest, I mean, it depends, right? Like, are you trying to read and understand him or are you trying to understand his thought? Because you're not gonna understand his thought unless, again, you go through a lot of these major texts, right? Like in the tradition, like Hadith and Tafsir and Fiqh and Usul al-Hadith and Kalam and Mantiq and Hikmah. Um, but like a good easy book is like some like some of his uh, Hadith stuff. So his commentary on the Mata Imam Malik, um, Al Musaffa, um, his auto, um, his, uh, his 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 reflections when he was staying in Medina and Mecca through the Haramain, some of his dreams. The Arabic is kind of hard, but it's not like too intellectual. Um, some and then his reflections on Hadith, so Adur Thamin is very very, um, and then Al Mubashirat, some of his dreams. Um, that are not um, confined to to Medina and Mecca, but yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so inshallah gonna be um, doing some work inshallah Ula, that Imam Ghazali Press will be publishing inshallah. So very, very excited for that. Stay in tune, um, stay tuned for that. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan, um, Mullah Saleh Basir, for a very, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, I mean, even myself, I'm, I'm quite taken by the amount of work that uh, was contributed by uh, Shawali Allah. And uh, I'm sure that many people, you know, if you have... If everyone can recite a Surah Fatiha on his soul today yeah. at some point in the day, would be, would be, I would be very grateful for. MashaAllah. Yeah. Masha'Allah. No, thank you guys so much for having me. Asadakum Allah, Shakarallah, Sayakum, Minka Wamin, you know, Min Akhin al Fadil al Karim al Sattar. So, Nafa'an Allah will be Almikum, Wahersikum, Wanafa'an Allah will be Almi, Ahliya Tisha will be Allah Dehlawi, you know, Asadakum Allah, Asadahullah of Darain, who Akramahullah of Darain, inshallah, or Aziz. Al Fatiha. Thank you guys so much. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.